So welcome everybody to the Meaning and Money podcast. I am Rabbi Dr. Baruch Levy, also known as B, and I'm here with my good friend and the financial expert in the conversation, Michael Feiner. Thanks so much, B. Michael, you want to just uh, tell us a little bit about who you are? We've done one podcast. This is our second one, and I know my people are still getting to know you. I'm getting to know your people, but why don't you make an introduction? Sure. Well, thanks, B. Um, I have a firm. I'm the president of Finer Wealth Management located on, in the North Shore of Boston, Massachusetts. And we focus on helping people reach their financial and life goals, wealth management, tax, investments. And uh, I got to know the great Rabbi Baruch probably more than 20 years ago when he was the rabbi in Swampscott, Massachusetts, and provided just immense inspiration to my life and into the community. So thanks for having me on today. Thanks, Michael. I'm uh, honored and privileged to be working with you formally now with this uh, Meaning and Money podcast. And I work with clients. Um, I'm a logotherapist, meaning-centered psychotherapist, and based on the work of Dr. Viktor Frankl. Dr. Frankl was a Holocaust survivor, created logotherapy, which means meaning-centered psychotherapy. And his thesis was in his book, Man's Search for Meaning and 30 other books, that if we have meaning, we have everything. And so that's why Michael and I brought this podcast together because he's the money master, I'm the meaning master. And together we can bring those two things, wed them, mastery of meaning and money because they're not mutually exclusive. In many ways they are interdependent. And and so we want to help um, the people we know, love, and guide to find and create meaning and money and make sure those things are working together. This is our second podcast, and we're calling this one, What's Your End Game? Because as Michael and I talked about in our last podcast, which was our first podcast, um, means. It's called a means for a reason. A person of means is somebody we say is synonymous with money, but it's a means. It's not an end We need money to get things in life, to acquire things, but we want those things for different reasons, different purposes. And so we need to start thinking about those purposes. What what are the means that we're searching for? And in today's conversation, the means and the end, what are we shooting for? What are we moving towards? What's our end game? So that's a conversation today. I thought maybe, Michael, I'd start out with a... um, sweet little uh, parable that I found. It's really quite beautiful and very pertinent to our conversation. So I'm going to share with you all this little parable, and then Michael's going to break it down and give us his wisdom around it. So once there was a, a businessman who was sitting by the beach in a small Brazilian village. As he sat, he saw a Brazilian fisherman rowing a small boat towards the shore, having caught quite a few big fish. The businessman was impressed and asked the fisherman, how long does it take you to catch so many fish? The fisherman replied, just a short while. And why don't you stay longer at sea and catch more, said the businessman. This is enough to feed my whole family, the fisherman said. The businessman asked, so what do you do for the rest of the day? The fisherman replied, well, I usually wake up early in the morning, go out to sea, catch some fish, go back, play with my kids, take a nap, spend time with my wife enjoy drinks with my buddies, play the guitar, sing, dance all throughout the night. The businessman thought about it and said, you know, look, I'm an expert at business and I can help you go further. I can help you do more and achieve more. And he says to the man, so, you know, you can start fishing and you can buy more boats and you can employ more people and you can grow this business and and, and increase your means, your, your financial resources. And the fisherman says, so, so what are you, am I going to do this for? And the businessman says, so that you can finally retire and you can move to that house that you've always dreamed of and, and, and engage in the activities that you always love. And the fisherman was puzzled and said, but that's what I'm doing right now. And it's this powerful parable, in my opinion, because oftentimes in the West, oftentimes in the 21st century and in the lives that probably everybody's uh, living that's listening to this podcast, we strive and we, we achieve and we accumulate and we acquire, but we're not like that fisherman where he's thought about 
his end game? What does he want to do? Does he have enough to do what he wants to do to fulfill his hopes and his dreams? The fisherman in this parable is so much wiser than that businessman because that businessman doesn't know the end game. The fisherman knows his end game. And in my opinion, that is one of the defining differences in a life of, of meaning and contentment and happiness. So Michael, what are your, what are your thoughts on this little story? No, that the parable is very powerful for, for obvious reasons and that the fisherman seems to have great balance in his ends. And as we talked about in the last podcast, his ways and means and sort of the balance that he wants in life. And he's very focused in, and understands his objectives. He's already gotten that down and he's, as you said, content with it. Where the businessman, I'm not sure, understands his own objectives other than the accumulation of, of wealth, which really is not an objective or an end per se. It's certainly not one that will ever be satisfied, right? There's just no satisfying accumulation in any area, whether it's food or whether it's wealth or whatever it is. It's the, the more is always better, right? There's always more out there. That, that's exactly right. And I think that the fisherman, ironically, and it may be more intuitive, has a better model for his own life and what he needs for resources to accomplish his contentment, his meaning, his happiness, which seems to be focused on his friends and family and, and himself versus just the accumulation of, of resources, which is more of a, a course of action. Uh, you know, you, you're sort of speeding down, speeding down the highway, not knowing where to go, except you're just gathering speed and, and whatnot. So it, it is, it's a great parable for, you know, making sure you really understand where you're going, which is probably the hardest thing in life to do because you think you know where you're going, but do you really, are you really specific enough in your objectives and your end state? Well, that businessman, the businesswoman, the person who comes to you for financial planning, more probably likely than not, they're a pretty successful human being by at least financial measures, business measures. They've succeeded and they succeeded in their respective business or their profession, probably because they had goals that they set out to fulfill, to actualize. They've executed on them for you know every day of every year, probably of every decade. And so they're successful because of that. And yet, I think we talked about it in our last podcast. Now take all that over to the other areas of life, you know, meaning and purpose and family. And they're always shooting at a moving target. And if they ran their personal life, like they ran their business life, or if they ran their business life, like they ran their personal life, it would be a disaster. And that's what's always so fascinating to me is some of the most successful people in business or in finances are oftentimes not applying that same success or that same formula to the other areas. I, I, I think you've hit on something that's, that's critical there. And part of it is, you're right, people who are conscientious and can set goals for the one, three or five year term uh, are excellent at accomplishing certain goals, but can they connect the dots for a 10, 20, 30 year goals? Because the long-term goals may be much, much different than the short-term goals. I mean, the the obvious goals when, when people are younger, you know, to be educated, to accumulate resources are in a way obvious to the extent that it's pretty obvious that if you have certain, a certain level of resources, you're going to have an easier life in certain ways, right? You're going to avoid certain amount of pain in life, but that doesn't necessarily lead to contentment or happiness in the long run. It's, I, I don't know if it, probably better in your space, but I remember a quote, maybe it was a Dalai Lama saying he was always amazed by how people work so hard and gain so much wealth um, and lost their health doing it and then had to spend all their money to fix their health uh, and, and whatnot, you know, that's sort of that vicious circle. And I, I do see that a lot from a perspective of, like you said, people are excellent in hitting certain short-term goals, but they may not be able to do more complex or compound planning or, you know, long-term goals that, that go into a different arena that aren't so linear. So it reminds me of, uh, I just taught my daughter how to drive and 
one of the challenges I remembered now, because this is the second child who's driving, is um, at first they're looking too close, right? They're looking too close to the car, like right in front of the car. And you can just feel this compensating, compensating, compensating. And one of the things I had to do was help her see, look out towards the horizon, right? Because there's something more firm about that line of sight is a more... You know, there's, it's more forgiving in the short term, adjusting, pivoting, moving around, and you're still kind of going towards a longer vision, and somehow it's more steady. That was my, that was, I just felt this shift when she stopped looking down and started looking up. It was a lot smoother ride, and I feel like that's kind of an appropriate analogy for what we're talking about here. No, I, I, I think that's absolutely right, and it's really hard to give people a long-term view of anything in many ways, especially life, right? You know, obviously it takes some experience and, and, and whatnot, but the earlier that you can have people focus not just on the short-term objectives, but look at the total picture, the total horizon, as you say, because you can, you know, like I said, you, you can miss the sunset for, you know, uh, the, the bird chirping in the yard. Who, who knows what's, you know, what's out there? But that, that's one of the things that we try to do when we're. People think when they come for say financial planning, I'm going to give them a recipe of here are the stocks that you should buy, here is the money you should save, here's the budget, and it's like yeah, that is a tool. But what I really want to know, which is the hardest part of the entire process, is please tell me what where you want to go? What do you see everything? What are your long, long-term goals? Not your short-term goals. Everyone has goals of making more money, hopefully being healthy. Me, I'd like to lose weight. You know, okay, eat better, all the, all the normal stuff, I suppose, right? Exercise more. But to, to what end is all that? Ultimately, for me, it's I'd like to be feel healthier, be more energetic, you know, um, all of those things, right? But I would argue, and I think you'll probably agree, we, we're using the same word for two different things. We're saying goals short term and goals long term, which is confusing, because what we're saying is that goals long term are much more of a, it's not a goal. I don't even think it does justice. It's what Dr. Frankel called, actually um, quoting Frederick Nietzsche, called the why. And it comes yeah. from this, this idea of you know he or she who has a big enough why can endure any how. And that's what got Dr. Frankel through the Holocaust. I mean, luck, you know, he just uh, Mengele pointed right and not left. So there's a factor of luck and there's a factor of luck in our business, our circumstance, our financial circumstances. But then there's also knowing your why. And what Dr. Frankel said is those who knew their why can endure the how, but those who didn't have the why, they couldn't endure the how. They gave up, they lost hope because the immediate goals and the, 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 the means are, the ways are always shifting and changing. And sometimes you run into true obstacles, true suffering. And so it's really about the long-term goals, which is far more of what I would call a why than just a goal. Uh, well, that's profound. I mean, I think you're exactly right. The goals are more, when we've talked in our last podcast, of uh, the means to an end. You know, goals are, are kind of a means. The why, yeah, that's powerful to know why you're doing it, what your vision is, the, the ultimate end state of something. And if you can nail that down, and that may change a little bit over time, but ultimately, you know, there's, you know, certain things that when the going does get rough, when you don't want to do something and you need to delay gratification, when you're not on course and you have to do, make the hard decisions, which is what this is all about, right? If, if, if the path were easy, we'd all be able to just say, here, here are the steps and just, just do it. But there's gonna be deviation for, for whatever reason, known, unknown, lucky, unlucky. So I think that's probably the most important, you know, takeaway from, from this, this uh, session, podcast, video, you know, whatever people are, are taking from this is that why, you know, peace. Yeah, to, to set out towards a why, right? And to have your why, to, to have that vision of the horizon so that, you know, you, you have a smoother ride, you're not you know, 
jerking the car around and it's it's a lot more uh, enjoyable. But also when you come across upon those 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 roadblocks, those car crashes, those those moments of suffering, of setback, you you have a again something bigger than yourself or than the moment to turn to. And, and I found in my own life, money aside, that that why has gotten me through hell, right? I've had moments of hell. And I know that if I didn't have my why, it certainly wouldn't have been a fun ride, but it definitely, it may not have even been possible. And I, you know, you saw during COVID, I, I counsel people for a living. Those who have a why to live for, COVID was still hard, but there was an end game, right? It wasn't just about survival. It was survival for what? So that I could reunite with my grandchildren who I haven't seen for a year. I mean, I can only imagine what that was like to a grandparent, not to see their grandchild, their child or the grandchild for a year. But we kept coming back to, so what's your why? And coming back to that why of seeing with their grandchild, being with their grandchild, kept them, you know, moving forward with deeper purpose and meaning that I imagine if they didn't have it, they wouldn't have been able to do. No, I, I, th I think you've, you've hit on the ultimate weapon, if you will, of, you know, designing a strategy if you know the why. And I, I like your, also your analogy about the horizon. I think that's criti absolutely critical because that gives you, when you're really talking about the horizon, it gives you that wide, wide view that it, it, it's hard to take in individual pieces. In fact, you can, you know, learn to adjust on a lot of things if you're looking at the horizon, especially if the horizon's a long, a long way off, which it normally, of course, you know, of course is. So th those two pieces are important ways to intellectualize all of these issues. If you can just think of your why and your horizon at all times, and if you nail those two things well, you can then back, backward plan the rest of it, right? Absolutely. And I think that's really the only way to, to start is to, to nail down your why. Why do I want this money? Why do I need this money? And then to back in from there. I'd love to hear some kind of, you know, obviously anonymous examples, or you can change some of the details to protect uh, the innocent, but I don't know if any come to mind. I want to, I want to throw one out and buy you some time to think about it. And it hit me that oftentimes when we talk about goals or your why and money, we talk about savings, right? Because we live in such a spend crazy world. Amazon, I had an idea this morning, I needed a backup battery for my computer. So within 10 minutes, no, 10, 10 seconds, I spent $250 on some battery. I'm not sure I need it. We live in this, you know, spend, spend, spend. And so usually when we talk about the why, we talk about spending money or saving money. But I just had a conversation with my son who's going off to college and he's a, he's a hoarder. He does not want to spend his money. And to the point where I had to sit him down and talk about his why. And he, he needs to have life experiences. He wants to have life experiences and I ain't paying for all those life experiences. And so we talked about it's responsible for him to spend some money because he's only been really taught or led to believe that it's only responsible to save money. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and how it relates to the why. No, it's, it, it's, it's interesting how different kids or people have certain, you know, natural instincts towards some spend a lot, some don't, some, you know, have different, um, different ideas. I think, um, you know, on the spending front, like in your battery example and other things, um, people want to take action. And sometimes action or lack of action can be the greatest enemy. So you have this horizon, you have your why, and then, you know, people want to act upon that. They want to show forward motion, at least a lot of people, right? If, if, if you're listening to this you know, podcast or watching the video, you're, you're doing it because you probably want to advance your, your goals, your agenda, your vision, your why. And people associate that with taking action. So I find people save and accumulate because it's an action step. You may not be able to define the why, but they generally, you know, there's a connotation of positive action. Mm -hmm. You're accumulating for a rainy day. You're accumulating for a you know, you accumulate for some reason. And 
when all else fails, you don't have either a why or something else, taking a positive action step does make people feel better. And intuitively, savings probably better than spending as a general rule. Now, I'd say investing might be better than saving or, you know, there, there are other factors, but I think that the, the problem that occurs in that is there is pleasure and there is gratification in the action of saving because it is an action. It's a positive thought that, you know, they're not taking inaction by spending, they're taking action by, by saving towards some greater goal. The problem is if you don't know what that greater end is, like you said, or why, you could be a hoarder, you could, you could die with a mountain of money, which maybe didn't help you, or you could, you know, do something else. So I, I might, you know, put that light on it. Well, yeah, but again, it comes back to, you know, what's the why? Because just saving as an action is meaningless. It's, it's meaningful if it moves you towards your goal. Right. And, and that's where we, you know, I just want to keep coming back to that there is money that does not have inherent value, right? It's a means of exchanging energy so that if I want to be able to take a vacation, I have to have this much represented in money to exchange for that experience. And, and so thinking about it a little more dynamically and fluidly, and that was my conversation with my son is that he, you know, he believed that taking action and saving or even investing was inherently meaningful. And yet he was doing that while he wanted to go to Israel. That was, he wants to go back to Israel to visit before he goes off to college. All of his friends there, he would have been uh, in, we left Israel a couple of years ago and his friends are going off to the military. And so he wanted to go see them first, but he didn't want to spend the money. And so the conversation was, well, let's talk about your why. And, you know, saving money isn't inherently meaningful. It can be, but what's the end game? And then we came to this point where he wants to spend his money because he wants to have the experience. And so that's how he is going to be responsible. Um, but it was just this great conversation we had on, on the meaning of money and the meaning of experience and the meaning of life and all came down to the end game. Well, I think that that is a great approach in the sense of, you know, he, your, your son had a great um, short-term goal to accumulate and it was rewarding to meet his goal. Um, but you just brought it sort of to the next intellectual level to explain that, which is, I think, a really important point, which is experiences are probably the most valuable things you can get out of life in different types of experiences are worth, you know, putting into your plan and maybe part of your why that most people who we're doing a plan for, it is to have experiences. It could, the experience could be to help a grandchild go to college, which to them is, you know, a wonderful experience, see the next generation do well. Having the experience of watching, if seeing your friends and paying for yourself to go to Israel could be the best, most valuable experience you have in, in life. If, you know, probably not a lot of people who, when I talk to, and uh, we talk about, um, what they have done in life. No one's ever said that the, like that three years that I worked, you know, my, my hands and bones to my knuckles and, and work just to death to accumulate this money. They don't describe that, but they may say, well, because of that, you know, I was able to take a, a trip with my family or, you know, maybe I, got a retirement home in Florida, or I sent my grandchild to college, or I donated money to a nonprofit, you know, whatever it may be, like you said, and I, I love the translation into, because that's, that's a great mental model of, okay, you've made this step of the resources, the ways, well, what are you going to do with that? Now make the mental decision. It could have been nothing. I, I still want to accumulate. I'm not sure. But if it's a worthwhile enough experience or it's a worthwhile enough piece of your why, then that's a great way to use your resources because we only have certain resources and that's not just money, time, energy, relationships, whatever your resources are, you've got to spend that wisely. And I think, of course, 
I know this now in my 50s, of course, I wish someone had, they probably did tell me, right, this 40 years ago when I was in your son's shoes. And yes, and to have somebody tell you that to, um, is to come off of autopilot, right? Is to start thinking about what's the point of this? It isn't, you know, it's Lily Tomlin or somebody said, the problem with the rat race is even if you win, you're still a rat. And like, are we just here to go through the motions to win the rat race, to accumulate the money? Why are we doing what we're doing? Becoming conscious of our life, taking our lives off of autopilot. Again, Dr. Frankel's thesis was um, that we ultimately, in the end of the day, all we have is a choice to choose either to react or respond to our circumstances. So I don't, I, like I said to him, I don't care if you do go to Israel. I don't care if you continue to save money. Whatever you do, make sure you're choosing, you're responding and not just reacting, right? Because that's what you do. That's what we all do. And so really, I think that's the point of our conversation today is to come off of autopilot, to take the reins of your life and to make your choices, whatever they might be and make them from a place of knowing your end game, and where you wanna go and, and how you wanna get there and why you wanna get there. It's the why in, in the end that is so important and critical, especially when it comes to money. Any final thoughts of wisdom for us, General? I, I think I think you know you you talk about meaning a lot, and I'd love to hear more about just the meat, you know, what you mean about meaning. There's a meaning of the meaning of meaning. I hate to be so glib or you know, sort of a pun, but the meaning is powerful of what something because we talked last time, the means is meaning, you know, the means to an end. But the meaning, you know, how do you look at that? How do you quantify that? How do you judge that? How do you sort of, you know, what is the meaning your son's getting from going to Israel? What is the meaning when, you know, we, if someone meets a financial goal, it has a lot of meaning for me, for, you know, people that I work with. And we actually meet what we said we're going to meet. But I'd love, love to get your, you know... I think we, on, on that for my edification. I think we have a podcast topic next time, the meaning <laughs> of uh, meaning, but the meaning I'll, of meaning, but you know, maybe. when when I counsel people, um, I, I turn to Dr. Frankel oftentimes, and one of the things he really talks about in his work is that it, it's he doesn't say this. This is my quoting Justice Potter on his uh, famous statement about pornography. It's hard to define, but you know it when you see it. Right. And the same is true with meaning. It's hard to define, but you know it when you feel it. And for everybody, that's going to be different. And, and we should get into it because there are some key ingredients to meaning. But ultimately, meaning is absolutely personal. You know, we have a fingerprint. We have a soul print. That's our, our meaning is ours. Um, so let's let's uh, pin that one on maybe the next conversation, the meaning of meaning and our quest for money. And that's what we're going to keep bringing to this, uh, to our growing, hopefully, audience and constituents is just a new way to think about something that is part and parcel of everyday life, the meaning of our money. So thank you very much, as always, Brother Michael, and thank you to everybody who's listening. And we will be back next time. Until then, you can get a hold of me at mysoulcenter.org. And what's your website, Michael? It's, uh, you know, finer.com. Finer so feel free. And we'd love to hear from you. So if you like this, uh, give us a five-star review and forward it to whomever you'd like. We're just kind of starting to build our, our message and our audience. And we're honored and privileged that you've joined us on this, uh, on this journey so far. Thank you. God bless. Take care.